Casey, we want to bring in another one of our contributors who has been listening this long, long day of testimony. Naveed Jamali is with us, author of the book, How to Catch a Russian Spy, a reserve intelligence officer for the U.S. Navy and an expert on all things Russia and the U.S. Naveed, as you listen to what we just listened to, as you witness what we just witnessed, your thoughts. Well, look, as a U.S. person who was, in fact, recruited by the Russians to spy, albeit under the direction of the FBI, what concerns me, Brian, is that it appears that this Russian front really had two silos. Um, the first was to retrieve data and, and, and use sort of an information warfare attack against us. But the second one seems to have been this simple thing that I, that I dealt with, which is to make contact with people within Trump's inner circle. And if that is, in fact, the case, uh, you know, that seems like that is an attack that may still be ongoing. And we've heard Adam Schiff and, and other uh, Democrats talk about SF-86s, and uh, those are documents that uh, one submits to get a background, uh, a clearance, in fact. What concerns me, Brian, is that if there was contact, if there was foreign ties, did the people who are now sitting in the administration who have these top secret clearances actually disclose that? And we saw with General Flynn last week that he now is registering as a foreign agent conceivably he should have done that on his SF-86. So my sense here, leaving the, leaving and, and listening to this, is that the focus of the investigation will be on sort of the binary question that relates to SF-86s and foreign contact and foreign disclosure. It is such an important one, and I can't stress enough that just because you had contact with a foreign, even foreign intelligence officer, while that may not be illegal, not disclosing it to the U.S. government, once you have a top secret clearance, very well may be. Naveed, are you struck by the wording we've heard even in our own discussion, people saying the Russian attempt to affect the election? Seems to me we can move that to past tense. That's ball game. Absolutely. I, I think at this point, clearly the Russians, you know, th this wasn't, uh, this was a very planned and, you know, uh, Malcolm Nance has written the definitive book about this. I mean, this was a clear, deliberate attack. I mean, this was a, an attempt to undermine uh, our, our very core of democracy. I think it's the second part, which is this foreign contact now, which is where the investigation is going to focus. Um, you know, it was said about 9-11 uh, that the cash expenditure to pull off such a, a heinous attack on this uh, country was not that much. It was um, kind of at its, at its heart uh, low-tech where it came down to carrying it out. This couldn't have been simpler. Uh, in, the, in the plethora of, of kinds of attacks we have been raised to expect from first the Soviet Union, then Russia, this was pretty low budget. Yeah, I mean, look, I can put myself out there. I did this for four years working for the FBI, and <laughs> the total expenditure that the Russians paid me was under $100,000, and I was a nobody. So you have to think about that the expenditure that the Russians would probably put towards this is, is probably very low. And look, at its core, intelligence operations seek one basic thing, besides being successful, and that's non-attribution. So this idea that if your mission is compromised, the ability to trace it back to the host country is something that you do in your mission planning. And I, and I have to think that as these dots become more and more connected, we're going to see a more definitive arrow that points uh, back to Russia. Navi Jamali, thank you very much for being part of our coverage and for being so patient. Uh, Katie Turr, uh, uh, take on that point we just left off. The fact that we really should turn this to uh, past tense language. You know, I... I I I think that this is